Last Sunday, the Patriots prayed for a savior to deliver them from the evils of a red-hot Dan Marino. Unlike Miami's previous four opponents, New England's prayers were answered by their defense. Constant pressure by New England's hard-charging defensive line led by number 98, nose tackle Dennis Owens gave Marino little time to throw. When the NFL's leading passer had the time, he was determined not to let the Patriots' blanket coverage stand in the way of his fine completion percentage. While Marino's sizzling arm fizzled out, fullback Mosi Tatuku, number 30, sparked New England's running game. Patriots outrushed the Dolphins 224 yards to 81. And Tony Collins' ninth touchdown of the season was all the scoring New England needed to defeat Miami 17 to 6. The loss tightened up the race in the AFC's Eastern Division and just might have started coach Don Shula thinking about resurrecting the running game he buried with the coming of Dan Marino. Piling another loss on top of San Diego might have entombed them for good. However, last Sunday, the Chargers fought off the best grave diggers in the business, the Dallas Cowboys. With a little imagination, one could see similarities between backup quarterback Ed Luther's offense and the high-flying unit led by Dan Fouts. But it would take a lot of imagination to think the Chargers could beat the Cowboys. However, number 55, rookie Derry Nelson's touchdown helped boost San Diego to a 24-6 third quarter advantage. Unfortunately for the Chargers, late game leads seem to be the kiss of death against the Cowboys. Dallas has come from behind in each of their nine wins in 1983, and they seemed intent on keeping their string intact. Danny White's touchdown pass to Billy Joe Dupree midway through the fourth quarter tightened the score to 24 to 23. However, the Cowboys had finally run out of final minute heroics, allowing quarterback Ed Luther, who had a Fouts-like day throwing for 340 yards, to experience his most exciting moment in pro football. Nothing much excites the Green Bay Packers these days, for they have just about seen it all in their roller coaster season. Last Sunday proved to be one of the Packers' good days. Packers' passing attack lived up to their number one NFC ranking, while Green Bay's defense, the worst in the NFL, worked hard to gain a little respect. Green Bay sacked Steve Dills six times and recorded a safety, their first in seven years. However, a perfect defensive day was spoiled by pint-sized running back Darren Nelson, number 20. Nelson ran the Packer defense ragged and set a Viking record gaining 278 total yards. Unfortunately for Minnesota, Nelson's little legs could not overtake Green Bay's strong-armed passing game, led by quarterback Lynn Dickey. Dickey's fourth-quarter touchdown pass to James Lofton clinched a 29-21 victory to put Green Bay atop the NFC Central alongside the Vikings. Although the Packers don't excite too easily, last Sunday's win even charged up stoic head coach Bart Starr. Earning a share of the division lead was thrilling enough, but for this up and down team, stringing together two consecutive wins for the first time this season was really something to get excited about.
Brian Sipes' game face accurately reflected the offensive output of the Browns and Buccaneers in Cleveland Stadium. Cleveland won with two one-yard touchdowns and a defense that recorded its first shutout in nine years by stopping the hottest running back in the league, number 32, James Wilder. closest Tampa Bay came to the end zone was Jack Thompson's 43-yard strike to Kevin House. But the speedy House was caught from behind by Cleveland linebacker Tom Cousineau, number 50. The victory kept Cleveland in playoff contention. The loss ended Tampa Bay's win streak at one. The longest losing streak ended in Houston, where the young Oilers showed the heart and desire to beat Detroit. Rookie Larry Moriarty scored an inspirational touchdown, and Earl Campbell silenced the controversy surrounding his playing time with 28 carries for 107 yards. In a duel between two of the best backs in football, Campbell bested high-stepping Billy Sims by two yards. But the day belonged to the Oiler youth movement. With Oliver Luck making his first professional start, all Houston points were scored by first or second year players. Despite only three quarters of NFL experience, Luck brought his team from behind with two touchdown passes. Houston's 27-17 win stung the Lions and ended the NFL's longest current losing streak at 17 games. Another team on a tear had been Cincinnati, who with Ken Anderson healthy again, were winners of three straight. Against Kansas City, the Bengals looked for number four and seemed to have found it. But the Chiefs' Bill Kenny hit on 23 of 34 passes for 244 yards to ruin Bengal hopes of making a late run for the playoffs. As they have all season, the Chiefs continue to surprise. Seven sacks of Anderson emphasized that point quite nicely. But when it came to quarterback sacks, San Francisco's Man Mountain Dean topped them all. Fred Dean, number 74, the 49ers pass rusher deluxe, made a shamble of New Orleans game plan. Dean had six sacks, and the Saints didn't make a first down the entire first half. Quarterback David Wilson was on the run all day as the Saints passed for a paltry 55 yards and suffered two interceptions. San Francisco recorded the second shutout of the week in the NFL. The defense was just part of the story. Joe Montana had a big day, throwing for 283 yards and three touchdowns as the 49ers earned a share of first place in the NFC West. It was only their second win in Candlestick Park in the last 10 games. With a December-like chill descending upon Chicago last Sunday, Bear coach Mike Ditka had just the right setting to go into a let's psych out the opponent routine. It's uncertain whether Ditka's sweater strategy was meant to put fear into the Eagles' eyes or intended to inflame desire into his own team's hearts. For in the early going, the hot hands of this game belong to Philadelphia's Ron Jaworski and Mike Quick, number 82. Quick's 47-yard touchdown grab put the Eagles in front seven to nothing. But as they have done all year, the Eagles' early fires soon turned to ice. 
With Philadelphia's pass rush all but frozen at the line of scrimmage, Bear quarterback Jim McMahon had all the time he needed to find rookie wide receiver Dennis McKinnon for a 43-yard touchdown score. McKinnon's touchdown came 10 seconds into the second quarter. With just 10 seconds remaining in the quarter, the Bears took the lead on this McMahon to Emory Moorhead touchdown strike. The Eagles did manage a brief second half comeback, but a fourth quarter Bob Thomas field goal sent them reeling to their fifth straight defeat and second of the year to Chicago. Final score, Bears 17, Eagles 14. The climate in St. Louis was a bit on the milder side, but compared to Chicago, the action on the field was about 100 degrees hotter. After the Cardinals took an early 7-0 lead, Seattle stormed right back on Zachary Dixon's 93-yard kickoff return. The first touchdown return on a kickoff in Seahawk history. Dixon's touchdown set the tone of a game that became a back-and-forth, non-stop aerial circus. Cardinal quarterback Neil Lomax, number 15, enjoyed one of his finest days as a pro as he completed 21 of 26 passes or 253 yards and four touchdowns, all to number 81, Roy Green. But what points Lomax and Green were putting on the board were countered by Seattle's passing combination of quarterback Dave Craig and Steve Largent, number 80. Three times Seattle came back to tie St. Louis, but ultimately it was Roy Green's four touchdowns to Steve Largent's three that made the difference in the Cardinals' 33-28 upset of the Seahawks. With Steve DeBerg's sideline, the Denver Broncos put the fate of their present-day playoff hopes into the hands of the future of their franchise, John Elway. But in the early going, this duel in the sun between two former top picks in the NFL draft was for the most part a decidedly defensive battle, with Jim Plunkett looking more like a rookie than the 13-year veteran he is. The Broncos jumped out to a 10-0 lead when a blitzing Tom Jackson popped the ball from Plunkett's hands into the end zone, where defensive end Barney Chavis fell on it for an easy touchdown. But the L.A. offense chipped away at the Broncos' lead. Second half touchdown runs by Marcus Allen and number 27 Frank Hawkins rallied the Raiders into a 19-10 lead. But then midway into the fourth quarter, John Elway lit up the sky and forged the Broncos ahead with a come-from-behind blue-chip performance that Bronco fans have long been waiting for. On the strength of Elway's arm, Denver set up a Rich Carlos field goal to draw within six. On the strength of Elway's legs, they took a 20 to 19 lead with just 58 seconds left. euphoria was premature. In the game's final 50 seconds, old hand Jim Plunkett hit tight end Todd Christensen four times for 58 yards to move within easy striking distance for Chris Barr's winning 39-yard field goal. For the Broncos, the last second loss dropped them to six and five, two games behind the eight and three Raiders in the AFC West. For their young quarterback, well, it was a valuable lesson learned in the art of winning from a team that has been most proficient at winning since the day John Elway was born.
Last Sunday, the Baltimore Colts set a club attendance record. Unfortunately, 20,000 of those tickets fell into the hands of pro football's loudest and most loyal species, Pittsburghus Fanaticus. Fans would come to watch their Steelers win their fifth straight on the road. The young Colts had a different idea, however, as Curtis Dickey rushed for the first touchdown, Pittsburgh's defense had surrendered in 11 quarters. In the NFL's 11th week, it's time for teams to show their mettle, and at times, Baltimore played with a mettle stronger than steel. Wild ecstatic dancing indicates that eager youngsters are playing above their heads. A subtle smile comes from being a four-time world championship team like the Steelers, a team that keeps their heads and wins important football games. Cliff Stout fired a pair of touchdowns, one to number 89, Benny Cunningham, and Walter Abercrombie ran from 11 yards out as Pittsburgh extended the NFL's longest active winning streak to seven straight, 24 to 13. Steelers know how vital a strong stretch drive is to being successful. Another team that knows that week 11 means let's get down to business is Washington. John Riggins, in very businesslike fashion, put on his hard hat, hardened up his game face, and ran hard the way only John Riggins can. Reagan scored twice from two yards out, allowing him to tie Lenny Moore's record of rushing for a touchdown in 11 straight games. Two keys to winning in this league are a solid running game and a mean, persistent pass rush. Joe Gibbs has both, as number 72, Dexter Manley, helped the Skins deck Scott Bruner four times. The only wrap on the Redskins is a secondary that is rated the league's worst, but after Sunday, giant receivers would probably disagree. With five games still left to be played, Joe Theismann's offense set a club scoring record as men like Charlie Brown have helped Washington to a league-leading 372 points, breaking a team record that had stood for 17 years. John Riggins left in very businesslike fashion. Gone was the hard hat, gone was the game face. All that remained was a 33 to 17 victory. The Redskins have a wealth of talent and an impressive record. The New York Jets have a wealth of talent. At Shea, Buffalo put their pads to some of that talent. Jets seemed to have a grasp on things as they cruised out to a 14 to nothing lead, highlighted by a 42 yard interception return by number 29, Johnny Lynn. Great teams establish the tempo, get the lead and keep the lead. The Jets established the tempo and got the lead. They did not keep that lead as veteran Joe Ferguson got hot fired a pair of third quarter touchdown passes, one to wiry Byron Franklin, number 85. Ferguson overcame 15 penalties for 110 yards, the most ever by a Jet opponent and capped a pulsating finish by hitting Joe Cribbs with 22 seconds left for a dramatic win, 24 to 17. In the stretch drive, great teams get going. The Steelers, Redskins, and Bills are going while Dallas and Miami uncharacteristically lost. But perhaps this Sunday will be best remembered as the day the Houston Oilers became winners again.